Yada yada hi dharmasya, glanir bhavati bharata, abhyutta nam dharmasya, tadatmanam shijam yaham, paritra naya sadhunam, vinashaya chadushkritam, dharmasam stapanartaya, sambhavami yuge yuge. When goodness grows weak, when evil increases, I make myself a body. In every age I come back to deliver the holy, to destroy the sin of the sinner, to establish righteousness. Om peace, peace, peace be unto us all. Good morning, and thank you for coming out on everybody's least favorite morning of the year. It's like, I couldn't believe it. It's like we have Shivaratri, in one week we have Shivaratri, Sri Ramakrishna's Puja, a lecture on Sunday, and it's on the time change. It's like, really? <laughs> so thank you for your support. <laughs> Appreciate it. Sri Ramakrishna may very well be the most important person that you don't know yet. Um, you might know nothing about him, or you might know a little bit about him, or you might know a lot about him. I always think I know a lot about things, and um, often doesn't serve me very well. But we can really know a lot about Sri Ramakrishna and still never really understand him. Never, because he's vast. He's like the ocean. It's like the more we know about Ramakrishna, the more we realize that we don't know much about Ramakrishna. He's so, it's like trying to capture the ocean or the sky or space. He's that great. Swami Vivekananda, his closest and greatest disciple, uh, spoke in the, this country almost four years, and in Europe. And during that time, he gave hundreds of lectures. Hundreds, and sometimes he spoke twice a day, sometimes he spoke three times a day. He only spoke about Ramakrishna once in this country, and once in England. So naturally, when he came back to India, the, his brother disciples said, why didn't you talk about our master? Why didn't you talk about Sri Ramakrishna? And he said, Frankly, I don't think I understand. He is so great, I don't think I've truly understood him. I am so afraid that by trying to explain him and talk about him, I'm going to limit him. People, he, he was just, he was so, and here I am, talking about Ramakrishna. Fools walk in where angels fear to tread, so <laughs> bear with me. But in, Friday we celebrated Sri Ramakrishna's puja, which is why the, the shrine is so gorgeous. And this is why people are talking a lot about Sri Ramakrishna right now. And I feel that it's Sri Ramakrishna came to the world to benefit the world, to benefit humanity. So anytime we think about him or anytime we talk about him, it's gonna bring it's gonna be good no matter what. Even even by limiting him, at least we know something about him. And then you say, Okay, so how is that going to help me? Because I look at him up there and I think, hmm, where's his shirt? He doesn't dress like me. He doesn't act like me. He doesn't talk like me. I'm pretty sure he doesn't think like me. And that's a really good thing. Because Sri Ramakrishna is um, extremely different from what we expect from another human being. When we think about things being relevant to us today, we don't think about Hindu mystics who lived like 200 years ago. Sri Ramakrishna was born in a tiny village of Kamarpakur, it's still tiny, which is in West Bengal, the closest city is Kolkata, which is a three days walk, even by bullock cart it was about three days. And every, Ramakrishna was really everything that we don't pay attention to. And everything that we pay attention to, he had absolutely no interest in. And that's why Ramakrishna matters. Because he paid attention to the things that really should mean something to us. Our attention is put on the wrong things. His attention was on the things that matter to us in the big picture. 
we value people who have made it. You know, they come into this world and they search and they scratch and they really work hard and they've made it. Sri Ramakrishna would just be appalled at the idea of spending our life making it in the world. Going out there because the means are limited and the ends are limited. The idea of going to school to earn money, just he just abhorred that idea. The idea to go to school, to spend that time just to make some money, he called that a bread bread earning education. He just he, he was he had total distaste for it. We really value higher education. You know, we all jump through the hoops, we go through the system, we get a degree, and then a higher degree, then a higher, higher degree, and a higher, higher, higher degree. We do all this stuff, but his idea is like to spend all that time and energy to get a piece of paper instead of instilling love for God. What a waste of time. What a waste of time. Are you, are you seeking something that's eternal? He valued the education that he, he had. He was functionally literate. He had exquisitely beautiful handwriting. When Borda Prana, Devi Prana, and I went to India in, in 87, we went to a tiny village where they had a, a palm leaf where he had written a, 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 a verses from the Chandi on it. And it was absolutely gorgeous. It was like calligraphy. It was so beautiful. He could read to a certain extent. He could write. But what he really valued was love for God. He hated math, which is the one thing we have in common. He, was, he hated calculation of any kind. He once asked M to explain to him um, the tides because they, were, they could see the Ganges, the, the tide coming in and going out. And he said, why does this happen? So M, his Western-educated disciples, had, took a stick and he's in the sand. He drew the sun and the moon and where the earth is. He said, stop, stop, you're giving me a headache. So like NPR Science Friday would be a total waste on him. He's like, how does this help me love God? How does this give me the real value in life? Our society puts great stress on sex and being sexy and being attractive to other people. He had absolutely no interest in sex. Abs why? Because it puts our mind on something that's going to fade and pass away. We think about the amount of time and energy and billions of dollars that go into like the Botox, the hair dye, the hair implants, the teeth coloring, the pills to make you frisky, all these things to be attractive to the opposite sex. It's, it's pure biology. It's like the peacock doing the dance. Da, 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 da. What's the point for a body that in trying to pretend we're not old, trying to pretend we're not getting older, trying to pretend that we're younger than we are, trying to pretend that we're only a body instead of what we really are, which is the divine within. So we're neglecting the real truth of our existence which is the divinity lodged in our heart, and we're putting all of our emphasis on the things that pass away and will never bring us happiness. And that's why Sri Ramakrishna was very wary about sex and money. Those things are the things that pull at our attention the most. And what happens is we get caught into this cycle of things that will never bring us peace, never bring us happiness, and in fact will just leave us longing for something that gives us meaning and fulfillment, and we try to find it in all the wrong places. People love, in this country, we're just in love with celebrities. We're in love with people with power. I do it myself. I, oh my God, do you know who I saw? Pierre Lafonce? But he, he just had a horror of it. The people who put all their energy into name and fame. And, and he was just disgusted by people who would fawn over people simply because they had money or power. It's like, where's your dignity? Why are you striving for that? The, the most important preacher of his time, the most important person in Bengal, Keshav Chandrasen, who was the head of the Brahmo Samaj, started writing about Ramakrishna in his, his newspaper. He said, oh, we have a great Paramahamsa, and he experiences these states of God. And he told Geshe, why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? It's like he had no interest in just the idea of just like, Ugh, why? You know, people, everything is being done by the Divine Mother of the Universe.
She will bring, she alone brings people, she alone takes people away. Don't, don't bother with that. None of, none of this stuff is important. Sri Ramakrishna, Swami Shivananda, his great disciple, said Sri Ramakrishna didn't care for anything in this world. And Sri Ramakrishna is everything that this modern world is not. And that's why he really matters to us. He, you say, well, how could that possibly be relevant? It's because of this that he's the most relevant person to us today. Because despite our advanced civilization, it's just a mess. You know? <laughs> it's just a mess. People are not happy or fulfilled. If you're not happy or fulfilled, then what's the point of our advancement? It's like all of us want to be unhappy. All of us want to be happy. All of us want to be fulfilled. It's just a basic human need. But we can't quite do it. We, we, live, we should be happy. We should be fulfilled. We live in a great country. We have religious freedom. Most of us have enough, have enough to be able to have a roof over We have shelter. We have clothing. We not only have our basic needs met, we have more than our basic needs. Most of us are pretty darn comfortable. Most of us don't have to worry about a roof over our heads. And with the advances of modern medicine, we're just living longer and longer and longer. At the same time, our suicide rates are alarming. Our drug deaths and drug addiction is alarming. Our alcohol use is alarming. Um, the, our increasing amounts of hatred and anger and vituperative discussion is absolutely alarming. So what, where's our much vaunted advanced civilization? And what are we living longer for? For more enjoyment? It's like, OK, are we having fun now? OK, now are we having fun? Now are we getting the enjoyment we're seeking? No. Why? Because we're going about it the wrong way. We keep, we, keep trying to, we keep trying to do the wrong thing again and again and again. The thing is, is that our nature is infinite. And we're trying in a thousand different ways to satisfy ourselves with what is finite and changing. And it's never, ever going to work. Because it's the same problem. We keep putting the same square peg in the round hole, and we just keep ch changing the color of the pegs. It's like none of this is going to work, because only the infinite will satisfy that infinite longing in our hearts. Nothing will ever work but that. So we need to hold on to something that doesn't change, something that is infinite, something that will give us complete satisfaction, and something that we can really absolutely depend on. And there's only one thing that matches that description, and that is God. Whether you call that God the Atman, that divine within us, or Brahma, that in div infinite divine reality that pervades this universe, or whether you that call that God Buddha, or Jesus, or Ramakrishna, or Krishna, or Rama, or the Divine Mother, Kali, or Durga, Saraswati, Sardadevi. It doesn't matter. The names and forms don't matter. What, matter. what really matters is that we put our hearts into something that's the infinite, because only the infinite will satisfy that, that deep longing that we have for that complete love, that complete satisfaction that will never leave us longing for more. That's the only thing. You know, in 1967, I came up here and I got my first book on Vedanta, which I got for 25 cents, a little price has gone up. Thus spake Sri Ramakrishna. It was about all I could afford at the time. And I was living on APS in Guterres. And I remember walking to school, going down Guterres, and then turning over on Milpa Street to get to Santa Barbara High. And I remember reading the first quote from Sri Ramakrishna. And it said, at night there are millions of stars in the sky. And then when the sun comes up, you can't see the stars anymore. Does that mean there are, no sun, there, are no, there are no longer any stars in the sky? He said, in the same way, because you can't see God, don't say there is no God. In the days of your, your ignorance, you will say there is no God because you can't see him. That doesn't mean that God isn't there. 
when I read that sentence, I, I actually, I remember stopping. I was right in the middle of Gutierrez Street in front of some person's house. I felt like I'd been struck by lightning. And I just put it here and I thought, I'm reading the truth. I'm absolutely reading the truth. I found a person who's speaking from his own personal experience. He's speaking the truth of God and it absolutely changed my life because it answered all the questions that had been haunting me for all of my 15 years. But I've been coming here ever then for the next 60 for the next 52 years I've been here. <laughs> but it was like I re I realized this man speaks from experience. And that's what I wanted to know. So the first question that we always ask ourselves is, is there a God? Well, <laughs> if there was a God, why are we going through what we're going through? We all think we could do a better job. You know, if, if I was God, we would not have had those mudslides. We could, we could have figured out something better than that. If, I was a, if, I, if there was a God, there would be no pogroms. There would there'd be no slaughter of various peoples. There, there wouldn't be all the suffering that there is in the world. We ask God to change things for us. If there was a God, God would change this. We ask God to change things for us. We never, we never realize that God is sending us those things in order for us to be changed. That's why we have them. Not that we can't change God. It's like, why don't you do that? No. We experience them in order for us to have the opportunity to be changed ourselves. So the first thing Ramakrishna would say is, yes, there is an absolute divine reality. Not only that, but realizing that reality is the goal of life. And you will absolutely do so because it is inevitable. It is your real nature. You are not trying to become somebody else. You're not trying to become pious. You're not trying to put on something like pretend holy. That is our real nature. It lies in the, that divine reality lies in the hearts of all beings. And inevitably, we will realize it. And if we put our effort towards it, we will realize it in this very life. If we want to postpone it, absolutely we can. We'll do it in another life, but we won't be happy. Swami Prabhavanand used to say, if you want to be happy, realize God. If you want to really be happy. And he said, it's easier to realize God than quit smoking. <laughs> he used to say, it's in the palm of your hand. If we're genuine and sincere, a teacher will come, we'll find our teacher, and we will be able to start on the path that will give us complete happiness and fulfillment because we're not going to find it any other way. As much as we try to be happy, I always try chocolate and caffeine. That's my favorite go-to place. But inevitably, it's, it has, you have the effect and then it's gone. So there, where, where do you go from there? The only thing that ever can satisfy that infinite longing is the infinite. So Sri Ramakrishna said, realize God. He not only taught it, he exemplified it in his life. That's why Ramakrishna matters. Sri Ramakrishna never said, believe in me. He never said, take, he's never, ever said, believe in me. He said, attain God, Ishwar Lab. Attain God, realize God. You can do it because it's, it's inevitable. And he said, whatever way you are drawn to God, follow that path. He said, God has infinite names and forms. Infinite are the ways to realize God. Whatever way God appeals to you, follow that path. But follow something. And don't do a little bit here and a little bit there and try a little bit of that and a little bit of that. Because as you say, you're, it's like digging a bunch of shallow wells. It's like, I'm going to try a little bit of the Sikh tradition, and I'll try a little Jewish, and then I'll do a little Native American on the side, and we put them all together and get a cafeteria garbage. He, it doesn't, it's like digging the shallow wells. It's like, you, that's why we need a spiritual teacher. It's, not, it's, it's in order to find someone who can uh, have the spiritual discrimination to understand our temperament and then to give us the guidance so we can dig that well that we need. Because if we try to dig a well here, we're just going to hit boulders. He can say, yes, yes, you're on the right path. Or watch out, you're going to get yourself in trouble by doing that. No, pull back. Try it this way. That's why it's so valuable to have a spiritual teacher. It's not one of those things we do well on our... If, 
do well on our own. Maybe we can pray, we can yearn, we can do that. But to really engage in a serious spiritual discipline, we need a, te- need a teacher. Even a thief needs a teacher. You need a teacher to even, to even work in the cafeteria. What to speak of, of the highest goal of human life? To realize the divinity within us. Sri Ramakrishna very nicely said, you can go to a pond, and one person takes something, you know, is, gets water from the pond, and he said, this is Joel. The Hindus say Joel. And the Muslims say, no, no, it's Pani. And the Christians say, it's water. It's the same, we're all being nourished by that same substance. We just have different names. Take any name in any form that appeals to you, but take something, be nourished. That's the message of Ramakrishna. Go for that water. Don't get caught up in the arguments about the name. Go for it, be nourished. Swami Vivekananda said to his American students at Thousand Island Park in Upper State, New York, he said that Ramakrishna was so loving and appreciative of all religions that people in every sect thought that he belonged to their sect. They all thought he belonged to them. And he said to him, all religions were true. There was, and he said he found a place for every religion in his heart. And then he said this sentence that I've read a thousand times but never really struck me until we were reading at the breakfast table the other day. He said he was free, but free in love. Free, but free in love. And I thought, wow. What does that really mean? To be free in love, that means you can love with your whole being, which means you have to have no ego, because the more we have ego, the less space you have for anybody else. If your ego is like this, then you got no room to love, because you're totally taken up with this thing. Sri Ramakrishna was so egoless, he was humility incarnate, that he was just like this very thin sheath over this luminous divine, so that he had the capacity to be able to pour out pure love on others, pure understanding, pure deep sympathy and caring for others. He had that capacity to be free in love because there was no ego. So why does Ramakrishna matter to us? Well, whether we know it or not, we have a very special place in the world of Ramakrishna. Once he was at Dakshineshwar and Sarda Devi, his wife, was there. And she said he went into a very profound samadhi, a very deep samadhi. And when he came back from this samadhi, he said, I have come back from a faraway place. And he said, I went to the land of the white people. Poor, poor guy. He said, I went to the land of the white people. They had not only white skins, in other words, We're not talking about just white people. We're talking about everybody in the West. He said, but they were white on the inside. They were pure in heart. Absolutely pure in heart. He was talking about visiting the West. And he realized that his work was going to come there. And when Swami Vivekananda, Holy Mother, had a vision of Swami Vivekananda walking across the ocean and pouring out, pouring out the water. In other words, taking Ramakrishna over to this country. So these are the people, we are those people that Ramakrishna saw in his vision. These Westerners with their white, with their pure hearts, who were sincerely longing for God. We are the people in his vision. We think we decided to come here today despite the time change? No. Ramakrishna had planned that long ago. We're here because of him. As as Swami Vivekananda said, Ramakrishna taught the religion of today, which means a religion of construction, not destruction. Not to knock other religions down, not to knock people down, not to say, Ramakrishna would never dream of saying, you are a sinner, change. All about, you are divine, your real nature is divine. All about, "I I have attained God and you will absolutely attain God as well. Never follow me, but follow the path that rings true to you. A soul that says all souls are divine. That is the religion. And never, ever criticizing another path. A religion of construction, not destruction. 
And he not only taught harmony between every religious path, that every religion is complementary. Every religion complements each other. But within every religion there is harmony, that we can worship God not only with form, but without form. He used to say that God is like an infinite ocean. And if you go over to the northern parts, the, o- the ocean turns into ice. And he said, similarly, the love of the devotee for God turns that the ocean, turns the water into ice, a solid form, in order to engage and please the devotee, in order to have a relationship. And then when that devotee attains the, the ability to, to relate to the formless, then it, the form goes back into the formless again. So there's not only harmony between religions, there's harmony within religions. There's no disharmony anywhere. He used to say, Yatomat tatopat. He loved these rhyming schemes. As many approaches to God, so are there paths to God. Just take a path. Don't sit there and think about the paths. Don't write dissertations on the paths. Actually, get on a path and go forward. Go forward. He used to say that all the time. Go forward. Go forward. Don't be content where you are now. Because the further we go, the more joy we experience. Go forward. He said, just seek God. Seek God any way you please, but seek him. He said, cake tastes good no matter what way you eat it. He said, you can eat it uh, You can eat upside down, straight ways. You can eat it sideways. It's going to taste good no matter what. But you have to eat the cake. And no one can say, oh, that is the best cake I've ever had in my life. Too bad you can't have it. Everybody has to get their own cake. My saying the cake is good is never going to do anybody any good. We all have to take, you know, get out the ingredients, bake that cake, eat it, and say, that's the best cake I've ever had in my life. We have to do that ourselves. So why do we get so distracted then? If God is our own, if d- the divinity is our own real nature, then why do, we, why do we get distracted by everything? Why aren't we more pulled in by it? Why does it, everything seem like such hard work? And that's what we call in Sanskrit maya, the power of, the power of allurement of things that are, the not, that are not divine or that le- distract us from our, de- our search. Sri Ramakrishna said it's like a magnet being covered with mud. The magnet is there all the time, but it gets covered by mud. So we have to remove the mud, and then the, then the metal will absolutely go to that magnet. No question about it. So that's the work that we have to do. It's, that's what we call the, the pur- purifying the heart. So all the meditation, all the prayer, all the selfless service that we do for others is all about just taking off the mud, removing those impurities so that we can see the divine that's there all the time. Or he used to say, there's dust on a mirror. If there's dust on a mirror, you can't see your reflection. You can't see your reflection very well. It gives a distorted picture. So why is there dust on a mirror? Don't worry about it. Don't ask why. There's my, there is. It's there. Just clean it. Clean the mirror so we can get it, so we can see ourselves clearly. If we see ourselves clearly, we will see the divine within our hearts. If we can see the divine in our hearts, we're going to see it in everybody else's heart too. If we don't see the divine in our own hearts, we're never going to see it in anybody else's either. We have to have that truth be so real for us. We see it equally real in everybody else. So that's why we do this prayer, meditation, service to others. Getting the ego out of the way, removing the ego. It's all about getting that fat ego out of the way so that we can realize that divinity within us and within all beings. Only then can we have a blessed life and only then can we really serve other people. As long as we're stuck in our own ego, we can never really help other people. We can never really serve others as long as we've got this ego that only really wants to serve itself. That's what it's in for. It's in the chips are all for that ego. But when we can t- spend more time being aware of that divinity of ourselves, then we can really be able to serve others. Sri Ramakrishna used to say that God will continually pull at us. 
it's like, what is that poem? Uh, oh, come on, you all know the name of that poem. The, the, the hound, hound of heaven. That hound is going to go after us. Because it's inevitable. It's like that magnet's there, and uh, our, the magnet is there, and the metal in our hearts is there. It's always going to pull at us, and we keep trying to put other things there. It's never going to work until the hound of heavens is going to get us one way or the other. So the, the sooner we can put ourselves into a spiritual path, the sooner we're going to be happy and fulfilled. Sri Ramakrishna said, it's not, it's not that hard. He said, the breeze of grace is always blowing. You just have to lower your sails. So that, that grace to, to help us on our path, to get us going, that, that grace is always there. We just have to put our sails down. What is that grace? Spiritual practice. Doing our meditation, doing our japa, the repetition of God's name, singing to God. Singing to God is a wonderful path. Chanting his glories. Do these things that elevate our mind, remind us of our divine nature. Do service. Do service for others. He said, if basically, we take one step towards God, God will take 1,000 steps towards us. And once we feel we take that one step, we'll feel that presence of God and then everything becomes much easier because we'll start getting that, that intoxication of love. Once we get a taste of that, a feeling for the love of God, then nothing is ever going to hold us back because once we get just a glimpse of it, a taste of it, then we realize, then we have our eyes on the prize. Then we have a goal right in front of us. Until then, we can, you know, just, we start doing some spiritual practice and then then it gets easier, then it gets easier, then it gets easier, especially if we can set up a habit of doing it. So that unless we meditate in the mornings, like, we feel like we haven't brushed our teeth or something, it feels gross. So once we set up a habit of spiritual practice, it becomes easier. Then it becomes a natural way of living. Another extremely important reason why Ramakrishna matters is that he came to awaken Shakti, the power of the Divine Mother in the world. Shakti, that he, you know, of course, that he was a worshiper of Shakti. He worshiped Kali, the Divine Mother. He, worshiped, he literally saw all women as manifestations of God, no matter whether, no matter whether they were the most pious woman in the world or whether they were a prostitute or a little baby girl. To him, every woman was a literal manifestation of the divine mother of the universe, and she was meant to be worshipped as such. He came to teach the power of Shakti and the motherhood of God and to awaken that Shakti in the world, which will help all of us with our spiritual practice. You know, I recommended earlier to reading the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. It's a wonderful um, diary, M's diary. M was his disciple, who took down notes and of all the conversations that occurred between the people who came to visit Sri Ramakrishna and his responses to the questions and his talks. Various sorts of people, some of the most illustrious names of India, people who would come in and talk to him and ask questions and he would respond. Now, something that might strike you as annoying or irritating or hurtful in there as his constant reference to woman and gold, which is what I want to talk about right now, because it's um, misleading. The words that he used in Bengali are kamani kanchana, which literally means, kamani means a young, attractive woman, kanchana, which literally means gold. Gold, not money, but gold. He used it because, first of all, it's a it's an old term in Sanskrit. It's been used. It's been used for hundreds of years, and it simply means lust and greed. That's all it means. Sri Ramakrishna used a lot of rhyming schemes because they're easy to remember. Kamani Kanchana, lust and greed. He said lok napok, literally means men but worms. It means don't, attr don't be attracted to people with power, money, or prestige. They're just worms. In other words, don't, don't pay attention to that. He, um, granti granta, 
which literally means books not. What it means is that don't become so into your text that you can memorize, you can recite the Bhagavad Gita and not live the Bhagavad Gita. Be interested in the meaning, not impressing people with your scholarships. Granti granta. Oh, um, money bone kone. Worship God, money bone kone, either in your mind or in a corner of your house or uh, in the forest. So he used all these, Jatamat uh, Tatopat, as many ways to God, as many paths, so many ways to God. So he liked these rhyming schemes because it helps us remember. Uh, see the USA and your Chevrolet. Winston tastes good like a cigarette should, right? We can remember them 40 years later. Why do you think Ramakrishna said these things? What's important to remember was the man who recorded this, this, uh, the gospel of Ramakrishna was, duh, a man. Men were literate. Women, largely, were not literate. A very, very rare thing to have a literate woman in those ages, in those days, still now. Majority women, not terribly literate. So what he did when he went to visit women, so it also, India tends to be separated by sexes. Men in one room, women in another room. So when they would have, when he would talk to men, he would talk about Kamani Kanchana, women in gold. When he talked to women, he would say Purusha Kanchana, watch out for men in gold. He was not talking about the literal woman out there. He was talking to the woman in the man's head. That's the woman you've got to watch out for. It's that alluring, sexy creature located right in there that, that projects it to women outside. He was talking to the women about the man they have in here that they were projecting outside. That was he was talking about lust and greed. He had profound reverence for women. Yogin Ma, who was one of Ramakrishna's closest disciples, she was also one of Holy Mother's companions, Sarda Devi's companions. And she, she said, what she was asked about Ramakrishna, she said, and uh, comparing Ramakrishna to Holy Mother, and she said, oh yes, Holy Mother, Sarda Devi was very loving, of course, but no one could compare to Sri Ramakrishna's love. She said, no one could have the intensity of Sri Ramakrishna's love. He loved us so intensely that you would have to experience it to understand it. She also said that, uh, she said no one can ever understand how kind he was to us. She said he treated women and men exactly the same way. Exactly the same way. And I want to sort of let you know about that because it's, when you read the gospel, you have to remember he's talking to a group of men. But when you read the reminiscences of the women disciples, you get a very different picture of how incredibly kind and loving he was. What's interesting, too, is he insisted that Sarda Devi, his wife, continue his work after he was gone. When he was close to the end of his life, he told Sarda, you'll have to continue my work after I'm gone. And she said, oh, I can't. I'm only a woman. He said, nothing doing. He said, you will have, you will, he said, can this do everything? Can, I, can this person do everything? No, you will have to do it. He made her initiate some of his disciples. She gave initiation to Swami Yogananda, Swami Tri, Trigunatitananda, and M himself. Along with, she initiated many, many more people than he did. Many, many. Hundreds, hundreds of people. She, initiation, spiritual direction to after Ramakrishna died, she was the guiding force. When Swami Vivekananda was put in charge of the monks, who did he turn to? Sarda Devi. She was the Supreme Court. Whatever She was the one who said, yes, yes, you are to go to the West. It's like he didn't, he was like, well, not at all sure he should go. It was her word. She was the ultimate authority. Sri, Sri Ramakrishna told Gorima, one of his uh, women disciples to start a monastic order for women. She wanted to go to the Himalayas. He said nothing doing. Look at the women in Calcutta living like looking, living like worms. Look at how much they are suffering. You do your work here, and, and she was like, no. He said, no. You are to start an order, and you are to work here. 
this is very important for, for people to know because otherwise you get a very lopsided idea about what Sri Ramakrishna was like. He was, when you read it also, you don't, it doesn't come through how incredibly funny he was. He had a terrific sense of humor. He was absolutely hilarious. They would read, the, when you read the, the, the accounts of the disciples, they're literally rolling on the ground laughing because he was very funny and very free with them. He was also, he was just funny and he was extremely loving and kind. Swami Vivekananda said, pointing out a person's mistakes wounds their feelings. And we do it all the time. We can't help it. It's like, you really shouldn't have done that. Or, do you, you know, or it's, it's inevitable. We see faults in others and we magnify them in our own minds and we, and we don't notice our own faults because we're so uh, wonderfully perfect. He didn't. He didn't. He was so aware of the divinity of others that that's where he worked from. So Swami Vivekananda points, he said, pointing out a person's fault hurts their feelings. He said, we saw how often Sri Ramakrishna would encourage people who we thought were worthless, and he would change their lives. Change their lives, because he didn't respond to the outside stuff, he saw what was in their hearts. He saw the divinity there. When, if people don't meet our standards, we just dismiss them. Like, oh, that person's worthless. That person's a, you know, you know what that person is. We just, we don't listen to them. We don't, we fill whole prisons with them. We put them in systems. We, we put them in. He could not help but see the divinity in every human being, even in cats and dogs. He saw, he could, at one point he couldn't even bear to walk on the grass. He was so aware of the divinity there. He did not want to hurt the grass. He couldn't bear to see a, um, when someone pulled off a branch of a magnolia tree, he had hurt him. When he saw a boatman in the Ganges, they, uh, two boatmen got into a fight and one slapped him hard on the back. Shri Krishna cried out in pain and he had a mark of a hand on his back. That's how deeply and sim how much sympathy and empathy he had for all beings. Swami Vivekananda said, nowhere else in this world exists such wonderful kindness and such intense sympathy for people in bondage. But don't take my word for it. You're going to have to find out for yourselves. And you will. Because that if we just take one step, he is very, very ready to jog that 1,000 steps towards us. So I would like to leave you with the message that Swami Shivananda gave to a big group of Ramakrishna's followers in 1926. And it struck me. He said, I invoke the blessings of Sri Ramakrishna on you so that you may have the strength and the courage, listen to those words, so that you may have the strength and the courage to realize the truth in this very life. They say that the words of a holy man will always bear fruit. Thank you. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Pur nam utachate, Pur nasya, Pur namataya, Pur nameva vishishate, Om shanti shanti shanti, Hari om tatsat, Shri Ram Krishna Panamastu. Filled with Brahman are the things we see. Filled with Brahman are the things we see not. From out of Brahman flows all that is, yet Brahman is still the same. Om peace, peace, peace be unto us all.